May the Lord's name be glorified as we uh, continue to look at uh, God's Word in the Old Testament and we uncover the Gospel uh, through that. We started last week looking at the Psalms, we looked at Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. We, show, uh, you know, we looked at how Psalm 1 is about happy is the man, who is the happy man, and he's the one who uh, meditates on the word of God day and night and sits in the council of the righteous. Psalm 2 talks about the anointed king of God who is the Messiah. And we saw that the bridge between these two psalms is Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate blessed man of Psalm 1. He's the one who did God's will perfectly. He's also the Messiah of Psalm 2. And how do we wicked people become the blessed people of Psalm 1 through the sacrifice of the blessed man who is Christ and who is also the Messiah. So when you come to Psalm 22, I would say like after maybe Psalm 23, it is probably the most recognizable Psalm for a Christian. You know, one of the interesting things about Psalm 22 is that it only perhaps makes sense for a Christian. It is, it is kind of unique in the Psalter that there is a psalm that only actually makes sense in light of the Christian faith. Not even the Old Testament religion or the current Jewish religion can make sense of Psalm 22, apart from our faith. And we know that, you know, Jesus uttered uh, from the cross, Psalm 22, verse 1, about the ninth hour in Matthew chapter 27, we read, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then you go to verse 16 of Psalm 22, it says, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me, they have pierced my hands and feet. You know, even though this is written by David, the only incident or uh, situation in life in the scriptures that makes sense of this is not in David's life, but it is in the life of Christ. And we'll talk more about that as we go through this passage. So Psalm 22 is the counterpart to Isaiah chapter 53 for our worship. You know, even when we come to remember our Lord and Savior every uh, Sunday. Those two are linked together, Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. And it is the narrative foretold hundreds of years prior to Christ's crucifixion. It tells us about the ultimate sacrifice that enables all of us to be counted as righteous. And therefore, it continues to be a centerpiece of our worship. You know, the preacher James Boyce says that in all the Bible, this is the best description of Jesus' crucifixion. That is, even when you take into account the Gospels, there is perhaps no more fulsome description of the crucifixion than Psalm 22. And so the power of Psalm 22, you can see it prophesies itself. In the last two verses of Psalm 22, it says, Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. So the psalm itself says, this psalm will continue to be a reminder of the Lord over many generations. And that includes to our children. You know, you know, I think Vijay was talking about the importance of training our children. And the Bible says, you know, this is our, one of our responsibilities is that those of us who have been given the privilege, we need to proclaim his righteousness, even to a people yet unborn. But really what that means is to every generation that comes in. You know, just as an aside, you know, I was uh, thinking of what to do for our ABC from next week. And one of the things I think I want to talk about 
is uh, how technology is impacting us as human beings. And there is, uh, there is something in, uh, in, in medical science called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. Yeah, I don't exactly know what it fully means. You can go ask Alex or Josh after the meeting. But what it basically means is that our brains adapt in a way to uh, adapt in a way to uh, uh, it adapts to the way in which we live. Basically, so basically, uh, if you do more things of one kind, your brain transforms itself to make you more efficient at doing that. It makes you think that that is more satisfying. It makes you think that that is things that you should want to do. And then it will uh, turn against things that do not fit into that pattern. So it's basically, you know, if you think of neuroplasticity, it's saying that your brain is going to change itself. And, and, and we see that today, right? Everyone's talking about or people don't have enough attention spans. Uh, people get distracted too easily. There's a problem in the workplace. So we have uh, things like, uh, we have these uh, apps. It's called a Pomodoro timer. I don't know how many of you use something like that. Basically, it's a thing that blocks everything on your computer for 25 minutes and then gives you a five minute break. Because that's the only way people today can focus. There is no other way, because our, their brains have been transformed. You know, what's funny is that most people today can't even sit through a YouTube video. You know, if you think of a YouTube video, it's like an average of, I don't know, five, six, eight minutes. Most people can't sit through an entire YouTube video. That's why now they have these uh, shorts or reels doesn't take more than 30 seconds. What the Bible says in Psalm 1 is that if you meditate on the word of God day and night, it transforms your thinking. And that's what science says as well. What you meditate on, what your habits are, that transforms your life. That dictates the course of your life. And so the challenge for us is you know, we have put ourselves in the situation where if we, we probably can't even sit through a 30-minute sermon without getting distracted. The question is, how do we transform that? It is because we have to force ourselves. Like, at some point, we have to learn to force ourselves to do these things. And then our brains will adapt to that. If you think that, oh, this is the way I am, then that's the way it's going to be. And we see a lot of societal issues now because of uh, these patterns. You know, schools are banning cell phones usage in school, uh, so on and so forth. There's a huge discussion on screen time and things like that for young children. But basically, that's the wisdom that the Word of God has given us centuries ago, is that what you immerse yourself in is how your body and your brains will react. So I want to encourage all of us to try to not be distracted when we look at God's word. So there are three things today that uh, I want to cover uh, in Psalm 22. It's a very familiar psalm. So I want to talk uh, at a high level about three things. One, it tells us about the prophetic power of scripture. Secondly, it talks about uh, the unique but at the same time, the exemplary sacrifice or suffering of Christ. That is, the suffering of Christ is unique. Nobody else can repeat it, and nobody else will have to undergo the particular suffering that he had. But at the same time, it is an example for all of us how to suffer when we undergo circumstances in life. And lastly, we talk about the benefits of a sacrifice to us. What do we mean when you talk about the prophetic power of Psalm 22? It is so detailed about the crucifixion of Christ, and it's so accurate that it only makes sense as a prophecy. It doesn't make sense in any other form of, as any other form of 
literature. There's no event in David's life that matches the details of what is described in Psalm 22, even though David wrote it. There's no event that matches it. So, for example, uh, there is all who see me mock me. Uh, they make mouths at me. They wag their heads. Uh, verse 8, he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. There's a mocking that is fulfilled where? At the cross. When the, when the leaders and the people pass by, this is what they say. He claimed to be the son of God. Let God deliver him. And then you look at the, the, the physiological aspects, verse 14 and 15, I'm poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint, my heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast, my strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks in my jaws, you lay me in the dust of death. It, it talks about a particular kind of pain and a physiological phenomenon that is not just basic suffering. It is not just basic starvation. It is not just uh, a, a mental distress. It is physical. And then you see verse 18, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by Casting lots. So one commentator says that what, this, what Psalm 22 is, is not the description of an illness or the description of some kind of persecution or mental distress, but it, only, it is a description of an execution. That is, David is prophesying about an execution. But he has written it as if the execution has happened and the person has come out of it. And that only makes sense in light of the cross. See, it was one of the big challenges for many scholars who don't believe in scripture as prophecy, they believe that everything is written after the fact, is how do you downplay the prophetic nature of this psalm? Because there is no way you can uh, say that Psalm 22 was written after the crucifixion of Christ, or that Christians modified the scripture. This Psalm 22 is in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament. So they have come up with many theories. The most popular one right now, if you go to uh, some schools and so on, is that uh, you know, they have found like in Babylon, in Babylon, which is, uh, you know, which was a, a, a neighbor of uh, Israel, but it only became more prominent uh, later on after David's time, if you read history. Uh, they have found that in Babylon, you know, like kings once a year used to ritually humiliate themselves uh, in order to uh, portray themselves as dying and then being brought back to life uh, by uh, their Babylonian gods. You know, some of us who come from uh, uh, Eastern cultures, we know like sometimes there are things like this, you know, people come and like slash themselves with, uh, with knives to, to, and swords and so on. So they are saying like, that is what this is, okay? There's no evidence of it. No one has ever found that uh, this ritual, which was in Babylon hundreds of years after the time of David, was actually present in Israel during that time, but that's what they believe. Why? Because the plain meaning of the text is so clearly tied to the cross of Christ that men and women would rather deny the plain meaning of the text, even when it has been fulfilled, and come up with some theory so that they don't have to acknowledge what it says. So many of the challenges to the faith that we have today are not really challenges because they pose a problem that cannot be reconciled or solved. 
It is because it comes from the foundation of this way of thinking that uh, no matter what happens, I will not believe that there is a God who can write scripture that is prophetic. And so, if people will deny the plain meaning of the text when things have been fulfilled, how much more the things that have not been fulfilled? But regardless, Psalm 22 shows us the prophetic power of Scripture. And that's what, you know, the Apostle Peter says, First Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. It says, concerning the salvation, the prophets, including David, who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired, carefully inquiring uh, what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he uh, predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So that is what Psalm 22 is. And the experience that it describes in Psalm 22, the, the physical aspect of it, the pain of it, all of that, Jesus Christ underwent on the cross, as the psalm predicted. And that what the, te- the scripture says is that he did it for, for what? For whose sake? Who did, it, who did he do it for? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, We look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So the prophetic power of scripture fulfilled specifically at the cross of Christ. Secondly, we look at how this is both a unique, at the same time, it is a a sacrifice that is an example uh, to us, a suffering that is example to us. This is a one-time unique event, the cross of Christ. We saw that this was an execution. We, t- we saw the mocking and the, and the ripping of uh, garments. And we said, this is not true in anyone's life, including David's life, other than Christ. But also, you look at the deliverance in verse 21. It says, save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. You know, it is uh, pictorially describing uh, the experience of death. And then once that has occurred, you will see a turning point in the psalm from verse 22 onwards, where it goes into praise to God for that rescue from death. And so you ask yourself, uh, who died and rose again after an execution? There's no one in the Bible who died and rose again after they got executed, not even Lazarus, right? There, you know, we have incidents of people who died, and then they were brought back to life. But there's no one who physically was mauled and executed and then came back to life, except Jesus Christ. And you see verse 26 and 27. It says, uh, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. And then verse 27, it says, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Whose suffering will cause people's hearts to live forever? You think David is saying that about himself? Oh, if you think about my suffering and what I went through, you know, maybe during the time when he was undergoing the rebellion by Absalom or one of the other incidents in his life, or if you think of that, you have now got eternal life. Or whose suffering is so powerful that it extends the promises of God to the ends of the earth, and all the families of the nations shall find it a reason to worship God. Is that David? See, Israel was, you know, we read a lot about the kingdom of Israel in the scriptures. But make no mistake, the kingdom of Israel was never a huge kingdom. It had its, uh, the height of its glory was the reign of Solomon. And even at that time, it did not expand 
uh, a lot regionally or geographically, right? Like it was just a prominent kingdom. But there are so many other kingdoms to whom, in comparison to whom Israel pales. You think of the Assyrian kingdom or the Babylonian kingdom uh, and so on, even during that time. And there, David is saying that if you think of this king, the whole earth shall find it a reason to worship God. And this king commands the worship of all the world. Who is that? It's not David. Verse 29, all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. That is, even the rich and the proud will join the humble and poor because no one can find life apart from the suffering and sacrifice of the person of whom Psalm 22 talks about. And that is not David. That is Jesus Christ. And, and, and verse 31, you know, they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Now what did Jesus say? In the cross, on the cross, John chapter 19 and verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said it is, it is finished. So this is a unique sacrifice. It is a unique type of suffering that is not repeatable. But the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 to 12, it says, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So it's a unique sacrifice. But at the same time, it is also an example for us when we go through times in our life where we suffer. And specifically, where we suffer for being righteous, where we suffer for being true followers of God. This is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, that he wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection so that he may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. We have to become like him. How? Not by being crucified on the cross. You know, I've seen people, you know, you've seen those rituals, the seven stations of the cross, they carry the cross uh, across all the stations. Uh, if you go to India, there are people who roll around the church, uh, you know, and so on. Like, that's not how you become like him. Not physically. Enacting on yourselves the sufferings that Christ underwent, but how he reacted to those sufferings. We have to become like that even in our own sufferings. See, verse 3 of Psalm 22, immediately after it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It says, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praise of Israel. Our sufferings should not obscure our view of God's greatness and his goodness to us. Because that is not the example of Christ. That is the example that the world thinks, uh, or, or that is what the world thinks religion is. Which is that when you go through sufferings, it is a sign that there is no God. In a verse 8, the mockers say, He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. What is the world thing religion is? Religion is convenience. You only see God for your own convenience. So now that you have delighted in God, what should God do? God should deliver you. God should rescue you. God should give you wealth. God should give you riches. God should give you success. It is the religion of convenience. That is what the mockers said to Christ. You have delighted in him. Let him deliver you. But that is not the example of Christ. And remarkably, unlike so many other psalms, including psalms written by David, there is no call for vengeance in this psalm. There is no call for revenge. 
And we were reminding ourselves earlier today during that remembrance time, what did Jesus Christ say from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Even in his death, he did not seek vengeance that was not his to enact, but rather submitted it into the hands of God. And then you see the response to that, to his uh, deliverance, verse 25, from you comes my praise in the great congregation, my vows I will perform before those who fear him. He draws our praise to God the Father for his sacrifice and resurrection. So also we are to praise God visibly and audibly, not just when it suits us, not just when God caters uh, to our needs, but all the time, and especially when God gives us rescue from situations. So I, Peter again says in uh, chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verse 21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. We are to live like him, and when we suffer, we are to suffer like him, so that we can trust in God and give praise to God like he does, regardless of circumstances. Lastly, you know, the benefits of a sacrifice to us, it's something that we are all familiar with. You know, we remember it uh, week after week. So let me just quickly uh, go through that. We already said the benefits of this king's suffering extends to the uh, to the uh, all the ends of the earth. Unlike David, the benefit of what this king did is not just to ethnic Israel, but it is also to all of us who are Gentiles, who are considered to be outside the fold of God's covenant people. And he makes us a new people, a congregation. Come back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It says, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. That is a reference from Psalm 22. And the writer of Hebrews says that that is fulfilled by Christ as he makes the people who trust in him, a congregation. And you see, that is, you know, we call the series The Road to Emmaus, right? What happened on the road to Emmaus? There are two people, and Christ is in their midst. Immediately, you know, after his resurrection, we see that he is creating a congregation where two or three are gathered in my name there am I in the midst of them. Verse 26, chapter 20, uh, Psalm 22. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. So eating was uh, a communal meal. Was in the law. It was, uh, it was one of the, uh, the prescribed offerings to God uh, when God uh, delivered uh, people. And what happens on the road to Emmaus? Luke chapter 24, verse 30, when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And immediately after this, he disappears from their sight. And today also, he has given us a meal. We share a meal, the Lord's Supper, that commemorates the sacrifice of Christ, but also is the means by which we give praise to God for his resurrection. So he establishes the congregation, and through that congregation, there is praise to God that has been given up because of the work of Christ. But you know, what's an amazing feature of uh, what we call the canon of scripture in the Psalms is that there is Psalm 22, which talks of uh, the forsaken king, or the crucified king. There is Psalm 24, which talks of the king of glory. Psalm 24, verse 7 
and 8. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Who is this King of glory? And we read the scriptures, that is Jesus Christ. James chapter 2, verse 1, it says, My brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, it talks about when he comes back on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the King of glory. He is the king who is executed in Psalm 22. He is the king who is glorified in Psalm 24. In between, there is Psalm 23. And that says, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Verse 3, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then what does he do? Verse 5 and 6, you prepare a table for me in the, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we talk of Psalm 23, Psalm 22 has to come first. And where are we going towards? Psalm 24. There is going to be a time when the whole world, by choice or by compulsion, will acknowledge the King of glory. They have no choice. But we are those who can claim that we are living a life in which Psalm 23 applies. Because we are in between the crucifixion of Christ and the return of him in glory. May his name be glorified. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this time and for your word uh, to us. We thank you, Lord, for your prophetic uh, scripture that has been fulfilled in the life of Christ in a way that is so unique and so perfect that it cannot make sense any other way. So we are grateful, O Lord, that you show us that your word is true and it is powerful uh, and that we should uh, obey it and hold on to it because of its objective truth. But more than that, we are grateful for the sacrifice of Christ, whose death, burial, and resurrection we come to remember week after week. We are grateful for the opportunity you've given us to do that in freedom. May we never take it for granted. May we always be those who seek, uh, like David and like uh, the great congregation, to praise you for what you have done for us. And we look forward to the coming uh, of our King in glory. But till that time, O oh Lord, we take confidence in the fact that we are able to walk in the paths of righteousness, not because of our own merit, but because we are found in Christ, who is our example, who gives us uh, the heart, who has transformed us to be able to, uh, to enter into the presence of God. And we have the confidence, O oh Lord, that no matter what our circumstances are, that goodness and mercy will indeed follow us all the days of our life. May we live like people who bear testimony to that. May we not be defined by the ways of the world or the circumstances we find ourselves in, but because we are the people of God, and especially because we are those who are found in Christ, may we live for your glory and honor. We ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.